Good evening, Singapore. Wow, I get to be the opening act for TEDx KRP. It's such a privilege to be here. My name is Margarita Kiewis, and I'm with the Persuasive Technology Lab. And I have to tell you that the information I'm going to present to you today is from the work and research of Dr. B.J. Fogg, who's the head of the Persuasive Technology Lab at Stanford. So I am only his messenger and his disciple. I will not take credit for the frameworks and the information that I'm going to give you today. It is all from his brilliance. So today I'm going to talk to you about persuasion for revolutionaries. How many of you have been keeping up with current events of the last few weeks in the Arab world? Amazing, isn't it? Let's talk about what's going on. If my clicker works. Hang on. Let's see. I ran across this great illustration by Mike Arrows. And he was talking about this about a year ago. And his blog is for people who do social media and marketing and things like that. But I thought it was brilliant because it's an iceberg and says what the internet is good for. The tip of the iceberg is awareness and persuasion. But what the internet is really about is sharing, cooperation, and collective action, right? So in the Persuasive Technology Lab, what do we do? We study how technology changes what people think and do. And that's what we care about. And I'm going to talk to you about how you can implement persuasive technology, not only for your startup, but for your social cause and to change the world. So first, I'm going to go into the FOG behavior model. The FOG behavior model is very simple, actually. Behavior, if you want to create a behavior change in anyone, and at the end of the day, when we want to have impact, we want people to do something very specific. You need to have three things in, in order for that to happen. You need to have motivation. Overlook in behavior is ability and trigger. So people could be highly motivated to do something. But if it's not easy for them to do, they won't do it. So when we think about ability, when you design an intervention, you have to consider, does the person have the time? Do they have the skill? Does it require money? Does it require them to think too much? Any of those things will act as friction, will act as a barrier for people to act. The other thing is that even if people are motivated and they have the ability to do it, if there's no trigger to tell them to do it, they won't do it. Now, who? what is the best trigger in your household? I know the best trigger in my household for my son. It's me. Because they go, Benjamin, have you done your homework? <laughs> There's the trigger, the call to action. There must be a call to action. Devices can do that. iPhone apps might do that. Facebook, when it sends you an email that says that you've been tagged in a photo, what do we do? You've got to go check out that photo because we want to see if we look good in it. And the next thing you know, we've spent an hour looking at that person's photo gallery. Very persuasive. <laughs> so triggers can lead to a chain of behaviors. And so in the lab, we always talk, figure out what the minimum effective behavior is that you want someone to do, whether it's for your cause, for your company, you want people to go on a diet. What is the one little thing that they can do? In startups, we call this minimum viable product. Okay, There's a lot of overlap between persuasive technology and lean startup methodology, I'll let you know just to let you know. But remember, everything big starts very small. And BJ often tells his students to not fall victim to the big brain problem. Because God knows by the time we get to NUS or Stanford or any great university, we've been conditioned to make things very complicated and very elaborate and very big. But it turns out that in real life, things need to start out small, right? And if you do something that's small, you can actually measure whether it's effective or not, because there's only one variable. So we often tell people, if you want to get people to floss, tell them to just floss one tooth. And you get credit for that. Baby steps, very, very important. Awesome, I'm only three minutes, 50 seconds into my presentation. Doing well. So the eight steps for designing for persuasion, and this is from BJ's um, article that he wrote in 2009. There's one, choose a simple behavior. One little thing, right? Two, choose a receptive audience, which means we need to find people who are motivated to do it. There's no point pushing a rope. If people aren't interested, don't bother. But if there's a cohort of people who are very interested in something, work on them. Find out what's preventing the target behavior. What is the barrier? How can you remove that? 
choose an appropriate technology channel. The reason why we like persuasive technology is we can measure effectiveness. If you can't measure it, it's not worth doing. Five, find relevant examples of persuasive technology that you can look at. And six, imitate the successful ones. Because what did Picasso say? Good artists borrow, but great artists steal, right? So you're going to find something that's great in one domain. You're going to say, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to replace it with something else. Boom, go. Seven, test and iterate quickly. You want to get results quickly. This is the agile you know, product development process. Now that we have things like Google Analytics and Kiss Metrics and all the Facebook insights and everything else, there's no reason why you shouldn't be testing to see whether or not something's working. And then expand on it, right? You got the person to floss one tooth. Can you get them to floss two? Can you get them to do their, you know, the, all the teeth up on top, on bottom, every day? Very good. Next. Mass interpersonal, there's a word missing, persuasion. In 2007, BJ Fogg and Dave McClure taught a class on Facebook applications shortly after uh, Facebook made that platform available. And what they discovered in those 10 weeks was that Facebook was a weapon of mass interpersonal persuasion. 100 students created Facebook apps, and over six months, they had over 20 million downloads. Astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. What did they learn from that? One, my slides are all screwy. Um, they resulted in a paper that basically outlined the elements of math interpersonal persuasion. One, you want to create this persuasive experience. Two, you need to have an automated structure. Turned out that Facebook facilitated things. You know, prior to Facebook, if you wanted to get the word out, it, say you wanted to do an email, then you'd say, like, okay, two, one, two, three. You know, how do you organize all that? It was very hard. Social distribution is very important. You needed to have a rapid cycle. So that way you can iterate. And it's helpful to have a huge social graph. In 2007, Facebook only had 50 million people. Now it's half a billion and, and increasing. And then, of course, you want to be able to measure the impact. So what does this have to do with revolutionaries? Well, you know, if we look at what happened in Egypt, and this had been happening over a long period of time, not just in the last few weeks, they looked at appropriate technologies. They leveraged Twitter, Facebook, and mobile technologies. One of the first things they did was create a Facebook page. This is We Are All Khaled Saeed. It is uh, multilingual. And so people, and what they were able to do was they were able to test if people cared about this. There was a lot of testing, A-B split testing, um, measuring the interest of people in this cause, OK? And you know, if you're familiar with Facebook pages, you can see the number of friends who like this, and then the number of people who like it collectively. You also need to have video. A video is very important, and it's very, very persuasive. And what all these things do is that it allows people to indicate whether or not they were aligned with this cause. They could like it, they could comment it, they could also share. And when people could share things, and they were, the amazing thing about social media is it allows people to synchronize their thinking. All right? So what is going on here? We have social facilitation. There's a lot of social psychology that goes on with Facebook and with Twitter. So that also happens in real life. But what's interesting about the, these platforms is that it surfaces it in a way that is unprecedented. So if you want to change behavior, people like to work, operate when whatever is the perceived social norm. And certainly in Singapore, I've noticed that you leverage that quite a bit. <laughs> So if the perceived social norm is that you're not allowed to chew uh, gum and spit it on the sidewalk, and you look around and you're, you know, you're ready to chew some gum, but you're noticing that nobody else is doing it, you're not going to do it right? in real life. What these platforms allow is that people could see if their friends were also going to participate, if they liked something, if there was some sort of consensus coming around on a particular issue. So on the We Are All Khalid, uh, Khalid Saeed, 98,000 people like that. That is social validation. So if I like that as well, there's less risk. Because I'm going like, oh, this seems to be the consensus. People are really coalescing around this idea. This is an interesting page. This is a page for a Syrian day of rage. And they designed it as a Facebook event. 
So, um, you know, on Facebook, you could say, I'm attending, I'm not attending, or I'm not sure, right? Maybe I'll go. You could see the 194 people who are attending. And if they're your friends, that might nudge you to go as well to this event. What was interesting um, about the situation in Egypt is that they did a lot of test marketing on uh, protests and rallies prior to January 25th to test and see if there would be sufficient people to come and gather. And they tested it through this, saying, well, how many people are RSVPing to show up? If 500 people RSVP, then maybe we have enough people to go ahead and do a rally. So we can pre-market it. And if it's not, then we don't have to do it. Design for metrics. No matter what you do, you should always be able to design for metrics. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. One of the saddest things that you can do is be a social entrepreneur trying to make social change. You spend 20 years of your life, and you can't measure the impact. What's the point of that? With social media, you can test. You can test with your website. You can test with your messaging. You can test with Twitter. You can, you know, there's, there's an infinite number of things that you can do A-B split tests on. You know, the wording that you use for call to action. You can, you, you can do different bit.ly links and see will people click through and so on. 10 minutes, awesome. This is a sample of a Facebook Insights page for my peace dot. I just pulled it up just because I don't know how many of you have used Facebook Insights. Yes, no? OK. Um, you can look at interactions. It'll tell you about page posts and um, uh, impressions and feedback. So you can put a message out there and see, has anyone actually looked at it? Did they comment on it? And so on. You can further drill down, and you can look at demographics. You can look at gender, age, the distribution, the countries of origin, the cities, the languages, and so on. So this is sort of like Google Analytics, except for people. And this is in Facebook Insights. So when we think about how to move people in action in baby steps, there's a continuum. You can move people from being sympathizers to activists. Right? And so sympathizers, the baby step is some simple action, some simple small participation. Maybe they're reading an article. Maybe they're, they're liking something. Maybe they're sharing something. And it escalates. And the, the thing that you want to do with these baby steps, and especially what was interesting in, uh, I was at the Bits and Blogs conference last week at Stanford, and we were talking about what was going on in the Arab world. And some of us were wondering if, uh, because there is very weak civil society institutions in these countries, did Facebook provide some sort of train wheel for people to test their public voice? So if you're in an area where you cannot publicly express yourself, do activities like participating on Facebook walls allow you to test what it's like to voice your opinion in small ways? You know, to feel like you can be heard in small ways. And does that action then translate to the offline world? This is still thing, things that are still to be discovered. When we look at the power law of participation, which is the wrong slide. I had a better slide. It has disappeared now. There is um, a continuum of low threshold. And here, you can't see this, but I'll read it to you. Reading, favorites, tagging, commenting, subscribing, sharing, networking, writing, and so on. Really, trust me, it really says that. Leading, moderating. And so what people tend to overrate is they think, well, you know, I, I created this community, and you know, 500 people are involved, but only 50 people are active members. Well, that's that long tail that you're seeing. But do not discount the people who are silent. In the open source world, they think that lurkers are good. And this is one of the things that I've learned from one of my researchers, Ryan Singer at Stanford. He says, lurkers are good. Because they're there, they're reading everything, they may not actively participate because there hasn't been a trigger that says, ah, finally you've gotten to something that I specialize in, that I can do something about. But when that moment comes, those people will appear. In the meantime, what you've done is you've been curating them and you've been bringing them along in your cause. And even though they're not actively participating, they will show up when the time is right. So you have to trust in that. Minutes. So, the engagement plan. You always need to have an engagement plan. And as the former VC that I am, it always comes down to the elevator pitch. You need to boil it down to the core. 
What is it that you want people to do? They have to be able to remember it. Why? Because they have to be able to repeat it to someone. If it's 14 paragraphs long, it ain't going to happen. I know that from business plan competitions. It's like, well, what is this company about? Well, it's about, ugh, you know, it's too much trouble. If you give it to me in one pithy sentence, whether it's a startup or a cause, it will be memorable. So what's a good example of that? We are all Khalid Saeed. That is a message that resonated in the Arab world. It synchronized people's emotions. It encapsulated the frustration that had been going on there for decades. We are all Khalid Saeed. And what was amazing about that was that this grievance, this feeling of disconnectedness that people had individually, all of a sudden through this YouTube video and through people talking and writing and blogging and all these things that they've been doing over time, and certainly with the Egyptian bloggers over years, it finally crystallized and said, like, oh, it's not just me that feels that way. You feel that way, and you feel that way, and all of you feel that way. All of a sudden, we have this collective grievance. And the shift in mindset was amazing because it went from this fixed mindset of nothing is possible, it is impossible to change the way things are, and then it flipped and said it is possible. Why? Because they changed the way they thought about it. And that was influenced by seeing the social proof that other people agreed. And that was very powerful. So I should stop there because that was pretty good. Engagement plan. You know, any good startup, any good entrepreneur, you need to figure out what that plan is. There's way too much detail. I don't expect you to read it. And then you need to have success metrics. In a business, you know, you might have, it could be content rating or visitors or member status. I mean, whatever the metric is, pick one and then test and see if you can move the number. If you can move the number, then you know that you've got something there. If you're doing an intervention and the number doesn't move, stop doing that. It doesn't work because it's not connected. The process that you need to go through is one of trial and error to see how, what is it that I want people to do? Is it engagement? Is it that I want them to retweet? Is it I want them to all show up on Toyota Square on January 25th? What is the number? Figure that out. Test for it. You know, there's been a lot of debate in the media of whether or not it was a Twitter revolution or a Facebook revolution or anything like that. I'm not Egyptian. It's not for me to say. But what I can do is show you what they said. And here it is from Khalid El Saman. Thank you, Facebook, for making a revolution possible, the Egyptian youth. And with that, I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs>